All right, so we want to welcome you to today's session, Letters for North Carolina's Little Learners. Um, it is certainly wonderful to see so much interest in the early childhood community around the science of reading. And this is truly a revolutionary step for North Carolina that is going to have lifelong positive impact on the lives of the children that are in our care. So we'd like to take a moment just to review some logistics. We have created a note catcher tool for participants. Please note that this will be a forced copy for you. It houses links to the presentation, a space for you to take notes, and we've included some links and resources throughout. So the presenters for today's session include Dan Tatru, who is the project manager for the North Carolina Office of Early Learning and three of the regional early learning consultants. So my name is Holly Lee and I serve the North Central region of the state. And I'm joined today by Cameron Amon, who serves the Piedmont Triad and Jessica Fitzgerald, our Northwest consultant. We'd also like to welcome additional preschool leaders that have contributed to today's content. Don Meskel and Keisha Walker are our 619 co-coordinators. Jody Kuhn, who supports the Title I Preschool um, program, and Macy Jones with the Head Start Collaboration Office. We would also like to give a special thank you to DCDEE folks who've lifted many questions from the field as well that have helped shape the content of today's session. So as mentioned earlier, we received wonderful questions and celebration around learners, letters for early childhood. And in response, we've worked to develop the content of today's session in a way that will address the themes and questions that we received. So today, some outcomes for us, our participants will receive an overview of the science of reading and start making connections to many of those well-known preschool guiding works. We'll learn how the science of reading supports developmentally appropriate practices for young children. We received many questions um, directed towards developmentally appropriate practice. And so in response, we've specifically addressed each of the nine principles of NACI's um, developmentally appropriate practices through our, throughout our session today in two different ways. Many of these principles are gonna be embedded throughout the session, and we're gonna spend some designated time reviewing a few more just in, um, in a little bit more depth. We also today want to consider the necessary partnerships that are gonna be required for effective community-wide launch and implementation of letters for early childhood professional development. We're gonna spend some time exploring available resources that can support your learning from today's session as well. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to get us started. Thanks. Hello everyone. Um, we uh, thought it was important to start with the why behind the state's initiative around the science of reading. And so uh, we're gonna provide a brief overview of the requirements for letters, um, specifically for pre-K in the legislation. The excellent Public Schools Act of 2021, uh, which is also known as Read to Achieve, directs the Department of Public Instruction to establish an early literacy program it also uh, directs DPI to consult with DHHS to implement the early, that early literacy program with the intent to build strong foundational early literacy skills utilizing the science of reading for children who are served in the uh, in pre-kindergarten in North Carolina, including uh, NC pre-K. As part of the early, early literacy program, DPI is required to provide literacy training to pre-K through fifth grade teachers and the administrators, um, including those who work in the NC Pre-K program. And the purpose of that training is to ensure developmentally appropriate instructional grounded, uh, instruction grounded in the science of reading. Um, in session law uh, 2021-3, DPI was directed to contract with a company called Voyager Sopris Learning, which is now uh, Lexia Voyager Sopris, um, to provide letters training to meet this literacy training requirement. And letters is an acronym in case you were wondering uh, that stands for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling. The law also requires DPI to provide resources that can be integrated into daily instruction to support uh, young children in their development of early literacy skills. And we will unpack these resources later on in the presentation. Additionally, uh, the Excellent Public Schools Act requires DPI to ensure that a form of assessment is administered, uh, administered at the end of the child's pre-K year, and that the results of that assessment are shared with a child's kindergarten teacher in the receiving elementary school the following fall. Uh, beginning in the 2021 school year, DPI 
is providing the Teaching Strategies Gold Assessment for all public school pre-K classrooms that are not funded through NC Pre-K. For example, uh, classrooms that are funded uh, through Title I and Preschool EC. Uh, this assessment is also being provided to all NC Pre-K classrooms uh, by, uh, provided by DHHS, uh, which will address the requirements of the law and create also create alignment and continuity across pre-K and kindergarten uh, to support smoother transitions. Um, over the last several months, DPI and DCDEE uh, have been working with teaching strategies to develop a transition report to meet the requirement of sharing this information between pre-K and kindergarten. Uh, and this report will be uh, completed by pre-K teachers at the end of the 2021-22 uh, uh, school year uh, with a, a few short steps within the TS Gold Assessment Platform. And then this information will be digitally transferred to the NC Early Learning Inventory Platform, where kindergarten teachers who receive children served in pre-K will be able to access this information at the beginning of the next school year. Uh, more information about how to access and complete this report will be released within the next few weeks uh, from both uh, uh, DHHS uh, Teaching Strategies and DPI. And then finally, uh, DPI is required to report uh, these three data points to the North Carolina uh, General Assembly, including the number and percentage of pre-K teachers who complete the letters training, uh, the literacy resources that are provided to preschool teachers and the number and percentage of children who demonstrate readiness at the end of their pre-K year. So during registration, we received many questions about the science of reading, wanting to know more about it, and you wanted to know what it could look like in an early childhood setting. We're going to spend a little time learning about what the science of reading is, just as importantly, what it is not. So children learn to read the same way they learn to talk. I want you to think about that statement. Is it true or false? And I just want you to kind of take that answer and keep it in your head. Children learn to read the same way they learn to talk. For those of you that thought, thought or responded false, you are correct. Learning to read is not a natural process. Infants learned to speak by listening and repeating sounds that are made by adults and connecting them to meanings. They don't consciously distinguish individual sound units called phonemes when hearing the spoken language. A child develops understanding of speech through exposure to language and opportunities to produce the severe, to produce the serve and return patterns of conversation even without explicit instruction. By contrast, Children do not naturally develop reading skills through exposure to text. The way they learn to connect oral and written language depends on what kind of language they are learning to read. Alphabetic languages, like English or French, use letters to stand for sounds that make up spoken words. To read an alphabetic language, children must learn how written letters represent spoken sounds, recognize pattern of letter sounds as words, and match those spoken to words whose meanings they know. Children will need multiple exposures and explicit instruction within the areas of reading to develop fluent literacy skills. We recognize that children do not develop and learn at the same rate. However, with appropriate literacy instruction, 95% of all children can learn to read and be skilled readers. So I want you to take a minute to consider the DAP principle number one and number five. Principle number one says, development and learning are dynamic processes that reflect the complex interplay between a child's biological characteristics and the environment, each shaping the other as well as future patterns of growth. It is important to understand the balance between biology and environment. This speaks to how language is naturally learned. Brains come wired for speaking. Oral language development relies upon the, the serve and return language between adults and children. For children to acquire the skills necessary for reading, children must receive explicit instruction, a factor in which we would, be, would attribute to environment. Principle number five states, children are active learners from birth, constantly taking in and organizing information to create meaning through their relationships, their interactions with their environment, and their overall experiences. Think about Scarborough's rope. The first strand of language comprehension includes background knowledge. We know young children's brains are wired for taking in information 
organizing information, and then creating meaning. This process of building background knowledge helps children construct meaning, creating what we call cognitive Velcro, which helps new information stick to the prior knowledge that they've acquired. Science of reading is about building your capacity as a teacher and understanding of literacy acquisition and instruction. It is also about building upon your understanding of how children acquire foundational literacy knowledge. So I want you to take a look at the slide and we wanna go through what science of reading is not and then look at what science of reading is. The science of reading is not an ide ideology or a philosophy. It is not a political agenda. It is not a fad, trend, new idea, or pendulum swing within instruction. It is not a one size fits all approach. It's not a program or component of a program or a singular or specific content. It is not curriculum. It is not something that you do in the classroom and it is not scripted material. When we think about the science of reading and the research behind it, what it is is a collection of research and thousands of studies from num numerous scientific disciplines. It is consensus of how we learn to read. It defines instruction that is likely to work best for most students. It is explicit and systematic instruction following a scope and sequence, and it is the recognition of linguistic differences within our learners. I wanna give you a moment to read Dr. Louisa Moat's quote below as we move through some more of the research. As we stated, this is a collection of years of research, researchers including Kilpatrick, Seidenberg, Moats, Castles, and many others continue to add evidence supporting the science of reading, which was publicized by the National Reading Panel in 2000 and affirmed in 2016 by the Institute of Education Sciences, What Works Clearinghouse. So next we're gonna be exploring some foundational models that have been produced to capture the essence of the science of reading. Prior to reviewing the models, we wanted to spend a couple of moments re reviewing some key definitions to support our learning. Our first definition for decoding is the ability to read words on paper, the letter sound associations. Language comprehension is the ability to understand the meaning of spoken word and reading comprehension is understanding and interpretation of the written language. The simple view of reading, SVR, is a, form, a formula introduced by Goff and Tumner in 1986. The SVR formula demonstrates that reading comprehension is a product of decoding, word recognition, and the language comprehension, which are separate and necessary skills to develop a skilled reader. Weaknesses in either decoding or linguistic comprehension will reduce the ability for students to reach the ultimate goal of reading, which is comprehension. The simple view of reading is a multiplication problem because we know the factors do not simply add to, but multiply across each other to achieve reading comprehension. If students do not have phonics skills, that factor, that factor becomes a smaller making of the final product, reading comprehension. Or if students cannot decode and that factor is zero, we will know the final product of the multiplication problem is also zero. We're going to take about a minute and a half to watch a video to further explain. The simple view of reading is purposefully formulated as a multiplication problem because the factors of decoding and language comprehension do not add. The simple view of reading is purposefully formulated as a multiplication problem because the factors of decoding and language comprehension do not add to each other, but multiply across each other. Thinking about this mathematically, if one of the factors is zero, the outcome, or reading comprehension, is zero. But more realistically, if a student has some decoding skills and a few more language comprehension skills, the reading comprehension outcome is greatly impacted and not as strong as when both factors are fully developed. So that was our first model. Our second model is another way to look at the process of reading is through a well-known model called Scarborough's Rope. Like the simple view of reading, Hollis, Scar Hollis Scarborough's Rope model breaks the skilled reading process down into language comprehension and word recognition skills. However, each of those two areas is broken down further into the skill strands that comprise it. So the word recognition portion is made up of phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition skills. Those three strands are woven together 
and lead to fluent and automatic word recognition. However, if one of those strands is frayed or broken, the word recognition is not strong. Likewise, the language comprehension portion of the rope is made of strands such as background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. Woven together, they build increasingly strategic comprehension skills as long as all of the strands are intact and strong. Like a true rope, if one strand is frayed or broken, the integrity of the entire rope is compromised. So if one, of more, one or more of these strands in the reading rope is broken, skilled reading is also compromised. The topic of science has helped us understand how our brains work when reading. In a really high level overview, the left hemisphere of the brain holds those processes that support the development of reading. The frontal lobe of the brain is responsible for phonological processing, language, and articulation. The occipital lobe, located in the back of our brain, houses the visual word form area. So this is where our brain um, recognizes visual information about letters and words in print. So the main takeaway is that the parts of the brain associated with phonology and visual word forms do not come naturally wired together in our brains, and that the connections must be systematically built in order for children to become skilled readers. So when this superhighway is built between these areas, then children begin to understand letter, sound, symbol correspondences and develop that ability to decode. Other parts of the brain contribute to reading as they help us discern meaning and use context to support comprehension. So let's look at an example of how the processors in our brains may work together to recognize a word. So let's start with that orthographic processor. This processor encompasses several functions related to recognition and recall of written language symbols or letters. It's important to note that this part of our brain does not perform other visual functions such as object or facial recognition. So let's take the word bat, for example. We see bat on the page. Our orthographic processor helps us recognize those written symbols of B, A, T. Next, let us focus on the phonological processor. So this part of our brain has many jobs which help, which help us perceive, remember, interpret, and produce the speech sounds of our own language and to learn the sounds of other languages. This part of the brain is hard at work as young children are listening and learning the sounds of their own language from family, friends, and caregivers. So let's revisit our word bat. While our orthographic processor helped us recognize the letters in print, our phonological processor recalls the information that bat is composed of the sounds b, a, t. When we help children build connections between these two processors, our brains begin to construct sound symbol correspondences, just as we saw in the model of the reading brain. We refer to this as phonics. In addition, our brains also house meaning and context processors. The meaning processor helps us understand words we hear and read both in and out of context. It creates and uses meaning networks to help us make connections and learn new vocabulary. So let's get back to that word bat. Our meaning processor is helping us consider if it means this bat, a wooden object that we hit a ball with, or this bat, that's the act of hitting the ball, or this bat, the nocturnal creature that flies around using echolocation. Lastly, our context processing system is primary job is to interact with and provide support for the meaning processing system. So for example, many same sounding words have multiple meanings, but only one is correct when used within a specific sentence. So let's get back to that word bat. When we have a sentence for context, we're able to identify exactly which bat was meant. We were able to take the written letters, connect them with their associated sounds, consider all those meanings, and within context, decode the word with accurate comprehension. So how do we sharpen those skills and strengthen those processors in order for children to master skilled reading? The science of reading has led us to the five essential components of literacy instruction, all centered around speaking and listening. So it's important to note that instruction in these skills will look different based on children's age, grade, and individual progress. 
In this slide, we share some examples of what each of the components may look like in a preschool setting. This is in no means a comprehensive list, only a few examples. So first, let's start with the phonological and phonemic awareness, which refers to those bigger chunks or parts of spoken language. When we ask students to rhyme, put words together, or make compound words, clap syllables, or set segmenting by onset rhyme, we're working on phonological awareness abilities. These activities are likely very familiar to you at the preschool level. As you think about children playing with the sounds of language, saying nursery rhymes, or singing silly songs. Phonemic awareness is the ability to recognize and manipulate each sound in a word. We often think about phonological and phonemic awareness activities being those that you can do in the dark. No print is required. It's all about tuning the ears to the sounds of language. We're getting the ears ready for what the eyes will see. Next, we have phonics in orange, which refers to the ability to map individual sounds heard in words to their specific written letter counterparts in the English language. Students who have strong phonics skills are able to connect individual sounds with letters and use those sounds to read words. As we consider this in the preschool world, we would think about activities that help children identify and learn about the letters of the alphabet and their connections to the individual sounds that they make. The third essential co component is vocabulary or knowledge of the meanings of individual words. Vocabulary knowledge is important to a student's ability to read and comprehend what is read. Children first must comprehend words in their oral language before being able to read them or extract meaning from them. So considering this component from the preschool perspective, we would think about how we are constantly teaching children new words. As we introduce new words, we consider multi-sensory experiences and child-friendly definitions that help build connections to the familiar. Fluency in yellow refers to the ability to read text accurately and automatically so that one understands what is being read. A precursor to reading fluency is rapid automatic naming of objects, materials, colors, and more, all of which preschool children are gaining competency and comfort with. And to complete this circle, we have comprehension, which refers to the ability to understand what one reads. It is the ultimate goal of reading instruction. Much like vocabulary, oral comprehension supports reading comprehension. In a preschool setting, we see this essential component incorporated into interactive read-alouds that are embedded with rich questions and deep conversations. So the first essential component of literacy instruction we introduced was phonological and phonemic awareness. Phonological and phonemic awareness was described as playing with the sounds of language. So let's take a peek into a preschool classroom for an example of what this may look like for young learners. Please pay close attention as the teacher demonstrates her understanding of literacy and language development while explaining her intentional sequence of introducing songs. Here comes Willoughby and Willoughby is ready to rhyme. Willoughby, Wallaby, we, an elephant said I mean. Willoughby, Wallaby, we, an elephant said I knew. Willoughby, Wallaby, waiting, an elephant said I'm Hayden. Willoughby, Wallaby, wheeling, an elephant said I'm Leland. Willoughby, Wallaby, Wawa. An elephant said I'm Noah, Willoughby, Wallaby, Wire, an elephant said I'm Maya. So when we sang the song Willoughby, Wallaby, Woo, and we got to Mila, and we sang Willoughby, Wallaby, Wheela, and then we said the elephant said on Mila, they could hear the difference between Wheela and Mila. That is useful so that when we're sounding out words, they can hear the first sound in a word. And it connects. As we progress through the year, we add new songs. One of the new songs we did was the apples and bananas song. It focuses on changing the middle sound and incorporating vowel sounds. So the children, as they're singing it, they're hearing the middle sound instead of the beginning or the end sound. We're focusing on a different area in the word. Are you ready to get silly with a silly song? Yeah. Okay. I like to eat, eat. Eat apples and bananas. 
I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat, eat, eat apples and bananas. I like to eat. So it's important to apply child development to all domains of learning. The teacher should, knows that initial sounds are developed prior to medial sounds and use this knowledge to plan introductions to songs within the classroom. So Letters for Early Childhood Educators is the professional development course that empowers teachers to understand the what, why, and how of early literacy instruction based on the science of reading. Teachers will learn the key components to early language and literacy, how intentional instruction can stimulate whole child development, that a balance of both teacher-led and child-led is a part of developmentally appropriate practice, how to identify differences and differentiate instruction to meet student needs, how to implement effective instructional routines and activities to assure that students are ready for kindergarten. So Letters provides in-depth knowledge and tools that preschool teachers can use with any well-designed early literacy program. So here you'll see the, the outline of the units of, a st of the study for Letters for Early Childhood. A link has been included on your note catcher, which outlines the outcomes of each unit and session, along with an estimated time it will take for completion. So just to reiterate, science of reading is the body of research about how the brain learns to read and the implications for practice. Letters teaches educators how to apply the research to their daily practices. So let's take a look at a brief introduction to Letters for Early Childhood educate, Educators from one of the authors, Lucy Hart Paulson. The newborn baby is able to recognize his or her mother's voice. So we know that auditory system and that phonologic system, how that voice sounds, which is phonology, is already establishing in babies when they're really, really little. At about six months to 12 months or so, they're starting to tune in now to what the actual words are and word boundaries, that's their job. And so receptive language is occurring. And then at that magical time, at about 12 months, they say their first word. So they've learned the sounds, they've put the meaning together, and now they're using oral language. And in those earliest years, infant toddler preschoolers is the time frame when our brains are the most are the most open to being able to acquire a language so the quote on this slide comes from page one of the letters for early childhood educators manual so early literacy is not about learning to read in preschool it is about building the important foundations needed for a smooth transition into early reading and writing in the primary grades. So let's read that again and take, let's take a few seconds to reflect. Early literacy is not about learning to read in preschool. It is about building the important foundations needed for a smooth transition into early reading and writing in the primary grades. So now it is time for us to pause and reflect. We are gonna have several of these slides throughout our time together today. And this is your time to really pause and think about the content that's covered. You may finish any thoughts in your note catcher tools, jot down any aha moments, or just write down a question that you may still have. So far, today's content has covered legislation, how the brain learns to read, what letters is and is not, the key models of the science of reading and the essential components of literacy instruction. So Nancy's first position statement on developmentally appropriate practices came in 1987. It emphasized the creation of rich learning environments as a mean for children to learn and explore. This inaugural version had very little focus on intentional skill development, and at that time, it was even deemed inappropriate. However, as, as research has continued through the decades, we have seen significant changes in the third and now the fourth revisions of DAP. To reflect the most current research, DAP now asserts that a rich learning environment coupled with intentional guidance and instruction from adults are equally important and necessary to support a child's development. 
all children. Letters is for all children. As stated in the DEC's position statement on MTSS frameworks in early childhood, all children can learn and achieve when they are provided with a high quality general education curriculum, services, and supports to match their needs. Additionally, all children should have access to the general curriculum and all teachers, assistants, and specialists should be actively engaged in meaningful interactions with children throughout the day. Letters helps teachers learn and implement best practices for all children. It can help them identify differences and plan for differentiation as needed. Much of the content of letters is about strengthening a teacher's knowledge around the developmental sequences of each of the foundational literal literacy skill areas. In addition to learning how cultural, linguistic and individual child differences may also impact the development of those skills. So this focus on learning the developmental sequences and responding to child differences connects with DAP principle number four. Although general progressions of development and learning can be identified, variations due to cultural context, experiences and individual differences must also be considered. Connections to the nine principles of NAEYC's developmentally appropriate practices have been intertwined into the presentation thus far. We will now highlight a few that have strong connections to literacy development and the knowledge teachers learn through letters professional development. We'll start with principle number two. All domains of child development, physical, cognitive, social, emotional, and linguistic, as well as approaches to learning are important. Each domain both supports and is supported by the others. We support development in all developmental domains, supporting each and taking care not to harm the others. Just as you would participate in professional development focused on social emotional development or physical development, letters focuses on literacy and language or linguistic development. In fact, Letters for Early Childhood Educators provides teachers with rules and comparisons for dialects and languages to better support all children. Letters and the science of reading have strong focus on literacy, knowledge, skills, development, and instruction. This does not mean other domains of learning should be discarded or overlooked. Next, we will look at principle number three. According to NAEYC's Development on Developmentally Appropriate Practices, when planning learning environments and activities, educators may find it helpful to consider a continuum ranging from children's self-directed play to direct instruction. Neither end of the continuum is effective by itself in creating a high quality early childhood program. Effective developmentally appropriate practice does not mean simply letting children play in the absence of a planned learning environment, nor does it mean predominantly offering direct instruction. In the middle of the continuum is guided play. Take a moment to reflect on classrooms within your district, school, center, or even your own classroom. Write down a few examples of activities that are self-directed by children. Examples may include inspecting a bug with a magnifying glass on the playground or building a structure without directions from an adult. Next, write down a few examples of activities that include direct instruction. A teacher explicitly teaching a specific skill, for example, proper hand washing techniques. It is important to remember neither end of the continuum is effective by itself in creating a high quality early childhood program. Again, effective developmentally appropriate practice does not mean simply letting children play in the absence of a planned learning environment, nor does it mean predominantly offering direct instruction. The next principle that we'll highlight here is principle number seven. Children learn in an integrated fashion that cuts across academic disciplines or subject areas. Because, of, because the foundations of subject area knowledge are established in early childhood, educators need subject area knowledge, an understanding of the learning progressions within each subject area, and pedagogical knowledge about teaching each subject area's content effectively. From infancy through age eight, proactively building children's conceptual and factual knowledge, including academic vocabulary, is essential 
because knowledge is the primary driver of comprehension. The more children know, the better their listening comprehension and later reading comprehension. By building knowledge of the world in early childhood, educators are laying the foundation that is critical for all future learning. All subject matter can be taught in ways that are meaningful and engaging for each child. The notion that young children are not ready for academic subject matter is a misunderstanding of developmentally appropriate practice. As you take your journey through letters, you are helping fulfill principle seven by deepening your understanding of subject area knowledge around literacy, the progressions held within, and the most impactful practices to support young learners development in language and literacy. Principle number eight, development and learning advance when children are challenged to achieve at a level just beyond their current mastery and when they have opportunities to reflect on and practice newly acquired skills. You will find many examples of challenging children to achieve at a level just beyond their mastery throughout letters. The knowledge acquired through letters helps teachers know and understand the developmental sequence of foundational skills so that instruction can be most effective, individualized, and appropriate for each learner. Let's take another peek into a pre-K classroom and see how a teacher advances development and learning as children learn just beyond their current level of mastery. These children are close to mastering combining two words to create compound words. Feed me, said the hungry thing. And the children asked, What, what do you want to eat? eat? Mm, I want um, a milk shake. Milkshake. Yes, milkshake. milkshake. When you blend the words milk and shake, you get Milkshake. Let's try another one. Feed me, said the hungry thing. And the children asked, What do you want to eat? Mm, I want popcorn. Popcorn. Yes. When you blend pop and corn, you hear the word popcorn. Yes. Feed me, said the hungry thing. And the children asked, what, what do you want to eat? I want a cup. Cake. Cupcake. Yes, he's yum, 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 yum. He's eating it all. He ate the cupcake. Because when you listened and you heard the words cup and cake, and when you blended cup and cake together, you got cupcake. cupcake. Let's try another one. Feed me, said the hungry thing. What do you want to eat today? I want, um, let's see, I want some corn bread. Corn bread. Corn bread. Corn bread. Corn bread. When you blend the word corn and bread together, you get corn bread. Yes. Last one. Whoops, you still have a milk shake. You have what? Milk shake. shake. Look, milk shake. You milk get shake. milk shake. What? Milk shake. Milk shake. You got it. You can feed him. And look, I see you still have a cupcake. When you blend cup and cake together, you get cupcake. cupcake. You got it. This is a monster. And now we have one left. What do you think he's going to ask for next? Gumdrops. And what two words do you hear in gumdrops? Gumdrops. You hear gum and drops. And then when you blend them together, you get gumdrops. Yay. Yum, 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 yum. Very sweet. Moving to smaller word parts may be the next step for these children, blending and segmenting words into onset and rhyme, which is a more difficult skill than blending and segmenting count, um, compound words. It's likely the children in this small group demonstrate similar foundational literacy skills and another group may be working on a skill 
that's different, but along the same progression. We'll take another moment to pause and reflect upon the content we have just covered. Specifically, we discussed how strategies learned through letters can be applied to support all learners and reviewed connections to developmentally appropriate practices. Again, you can take this time to finish any notes that you may have or questions you may want to jot down. We will now transition to considering how preschool and pre-K guiding works aligned to the science of reading. Many of you had questions related to the science of reading and its alignment to North Carolina's foundations of early learning and development, teaching strategies gold, or a creative curriculum. As Dan mentioned earlier in today's session, legislation states the Office of Early Learning will support integration of age-appropriate resources aligned to the body of research known as the science of reading. Along with those age-appropriate resources, an NC pre-K crosswalk was generated. As seen in this screenshot, the primary skilled reading strand of Scarborough's rope is noted in the far left column, language comprehension or word recognition. Moving left to right, you see developmental indicators from foundations, dimensions from goal, and kindergarten standards that align to the foundational literacy skills listed in the prior columns. This does not mean that the kindergarten standard is being taught. Again, we know that children learn and develop on a continuum and later skills are supported by strong foundational skills. It is important to remember foundations alignment is required for all approved curriculums. Therefore, the crosswalk addresses alignment for all. The link to this crosswalk can be found within your note catcher. We recognize that Head Start is not included in the original crosswalk. We've made some specific connections for you. Looking at the language comprehension strand of Scarborough's rope, we see alignment with many areas of the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework. There are many goals for students to communicate and use conventional language and answer questions. Vocabulary is a focus area in the framework as well and students begin developing and, dis and demonstrating comprehension skills. Also look at the word recognition portion of Scarborough's rope, which is also connected to the Head Start Early Learning Outcomes Framework. In a Head Start classroom, children are beginning to develop early literacy skills as they attend to and repeat rhymes from songs and stories. They begin to recognize words and symbols on signs. They also begin to develop phonological awareness as they hear and manipulate sounds. Print and alphabet knowledge expands as they begin to build automaticity in recognition and recall of lettered names and sounds. Understandably, we received many questions and concerns around letters, the science of reading, and Eckers. The body of research supporting the science of reading aligns to many components of Ecker's criteria. The scale of language reasoning includes books and pictures, encouraging children to communicate, using language to develop reasoning skills, and informal use of language. Let's connect each of these to Scarborough's rope. We will first look at books and pictures. As staff read to children during free play, at nap time, and more, Literacy knowledge within the language comprehension, comprehension strand is supported. Teachers are modeling print concepts and engaging children in conversation about different types of books, which may include genres. As staff encourage children to communicate and use informal language, development and vocabulary and language structures are supported by asking questions that encourage, that encourage longer, and more complex answers. Using language to develop reasoning skills directly aligns to verbal reasoning on Scarborough's rope. Children are learning to sequence by recalling and telling about meaningful experiences. They are also talking through challenges and solving problems. In addition to language and reasoning, group time is supported as well. Eckers encourages different groupings to provide a change of pace throughout the day. Staff are to engage in educational interactions with small groups 
and individual children as well as with the whole group. Lastly, Eckers promotes opportunities for professional development. Letters for Early Childhood Educators is a professional development course specifically intended for educators and care providers of young children. Teachers gain knowledge that is essential to becoming successful teachers of language and literacy instruction. Let's take a moment to see how a, in a preschool classroom, Eckers language and reasoning can be addressed while a teacher supports oral language development, which is a primary skill on Scarborough's rope. In this video, particularly, this child is describing how he has participated in center play earlier in the day. Okay. Cool. And what do you, what was the sidewalk for? It was for um, a volcano. It was for a house. Was, was it leading up to the house or was it just around the house? Um, we go to the house and then, and when you go to the backyard, then surround the house. Oh, so it leads up to the house and then also goes around the house? Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a multi purpose sidewalk mm. that you built. I mean, you use it for a lot of different things. Mm. You can walk around the house with you it. Can, you can walk, if you don't have the house down here, you can walk around and soak in it. The teacher in this video meets Ecker's expectations by encouraging children to communicate and use informal language. She asks the child questions that encourage longer and more complex answers. In this example, the teacher has created an individual activity within the routines of the classroom. Mealtime is a great opportunity for meaningful conversations that also support early literacy development. As the state is embarking upon the journey of integrating the science of reading into instruction, many conversations are occurring around the curriculum, resources, and tools being used within the classrooms. School districts are being cha charged to review their curriculum for alignment to the science of reading. This will be a necessary step in the process for K-5 and should also be a consideration for our preschool programs. We encourage collaboration and partnership with your K-5 partners. At a very high level, this process will likely unfold in three main steps. First, everyone will become familiar with the components of the science of reading. Your letters training will provide you with in-depth knowledge of each component and how it connects with our youngest learners. You may also find it helpful to build connections with your K-5 partners in other districts or communities that have already begun their journey and may be further along in their learning. Next, it will be important to consider how your current curriculum and programming address the key components of the science of reading. While all five components are certainly important, Letters places particular emph emphasis on the critical nature of oral language, phonological awareness, and print knowledge for early childhood. Lastly, if gaps are identified as you review your curriculum and programming, then it will be important to develop a plan to remediate those gaps. This could look many different ways. For some, this may mean changes to expectations, programming, or practices will need to be made. For others, it may mean a decision to explore additional curriculum options, resources, or materials to supplement what you already have in place. And for others, it may mean a combination of a few or several of these items mentioned. We encourage you to take the position in thinking of how do our current practices and curriculum align to the science of reading instead of how does the science of reading align to our practices and curriculum. As a reminder, DPI cannot recommend a particular curriculum. However, Please know that your early learning and early literacy consultants will be more than happy to support you as you embark on the process to review your current programming and curriculum. As we are in the process of reflecting upon our current policies and curriculum, NAEYC's DAP principle number six is another source to guide our thinking. Principle six says, children's motivation to learn is increased when their learning environment fosters their sense of belonging purpose, and agency. Curricula and teaching methods build on each child's assets by connecting their experiences in the school or learning environment 
to their home and community settings. Literacy in the pre-K classroom can foster a sense of belonging, purpose, and agency by making meaningful connections between content and each child's experiences. Teachers are looking at what the children are doing well and determining how to support their literacy development moving forward. Letters is not about buying more things in order to teach foundational literacy skills in your classroom, but providing the teacher with the necessary skills and knowledge to deliver strong literacy instruction with what they already have. Remember, with that in mind, it is important to be familiar with and understand the science of reading as districts and early childhood centers carefully look at the core programs or materials they are already using within their centers and their classrooms. Then they need to consider supplementing where there may be gaps in their current programming. We received several questions regarding science specific assessments and screeners. There are no requirement changes for the administration of any assessments in regard to implementing letters for early childhood professional development. However, we would like to share that Letters does offer an early literacy checklist. It is a tool that can be used to informally identify the general level of early literacy skill development of young children. The checklist assists teachers in formatively differentiating their instruction to meet the needs of the class and the individual students. The items on the early literacy checklist provide a guideline for determining which skills have been acquired which skills can be enhanced, and which skills need to be further developed. Information to complete the early childhood checklist can be collected from many sources you may already have in place, screeners, anecdotal records, teacher observations, and more. So again, we have another place to pause and reflect or finish your notes. Letters and developmentally appropriate practices, how knowledge learned through letters can support all children, Alignment with NC Foundations, Teaching Strategies Gold, Head Start Framework, Kindergarten Standards, and Eckers, Reflecting on Curriculum, and the Letters Early Literacy Checklist. So take some time to fill out any questions you might have and jot those down, or finish any notes you may need to take. And now I'll turn it over to Dan. Oh, again. Um, so uh, some of the questions uh, that we've received are just related to how does this all work? How do um, the public schools and community-based preschool programs partner together uh, for planning and scheduling this training? So this uh, this little graphic hopefully shows the relationship here, but we'll, I'll kind of talk through it uh, here for you. So the vendor, Lexia Voyager Sopras, works directly with the school district letters point of contact. The district letters point of contact is asked in the in in the very beginning to contact the local NC pre-K contracting agency and invite them to be part of the uh, planning meetings. And we have a uh, a link to those contracting agencies. I'll put it in the chat here real quick. So then the district uh, letters point of contact is responsible for communicating and coordinating with that local NC pre-K contracting agency. And of course, all the public school pre-K teachers, regardless of, of how those uh, public school pre-K teachers are funded. This would include preschool EC, Title I preschool, public school NC pre-K classrooms, and Head Starts that are operated by the public schools. Then the local NC pre-K contracting agency is responsible for communicating and coordinating with the uh, district letters point of contact, and then all of the NC pre-K teachers located in community settings, uh, including NC pre-K funded Head Start classrooms um, and Head Starts, uh, uh, th those Head Starts that are NC pre-K funded, not operated by the public schools. So that would mean, and, and, and as you know, in some cases, and uh, I don't know what the I don't know what the ratio is now, but uh, somewhere around half uh, are public school. Uh, the public schools are the contracting agency. Uh, however, it is often a different person who is the program contact for NC Pre-K in the public schools than, than is the district letters uh, point of contact. So, uh, and then in the uh, approximately the other half, there are a few uh, Head Start uh, NC Pre-K contracting agencies, but uh, most of the others are local partnerships for children or local Smart Start agencies. So, 
The, uh, all right, then the, the local NC pre-K contract uh, tra tracking agency, again, is, is, um, is responsible for uh, communicating this information to uh, community-based programs. Uh, training events uh, can accommodate up to 44 participants. And so sometimes what you'll find is you may be in a training session with uh, teachers from another county uh, because they, they want to maximize the uh, number of participants in each session. Uh, and, and in some counties, there are smaller numbers and in others, there are uh, much larger numbers, obviously, uh, of pre-K teachers. Um, we've, we have been asked if Head Start programs um, that are not NC pre-K funded can participate in letters for early childhood educators uh, training. And as mentioned, those who are NC pre-K funded are included. Um, and then uh, also if they're a Head Start uh, uh, operated by public schools. Um, however, um, what, what I'll call a, a standalone Head Start, uh, a Head Start program that does not use any NC pre-K funding, um, they are not included, but they can purchase the training directly from the vendor, from Lexia Voyager Sopras, uh, if they'd like to participate in the training. And there are a number of school districts and programs that have chosen to uh, train staff that aren't covered by the state contract, and, and they do that by purchasing that training directly from, uh, from Lexia. We are also often asked uh, who is responsible for ensuring implementation, that implementation occurs in community-based NC pre-K settings, which is kind of a tricky question. Um, the way that we've uh, kind of thought about it is that the local NC pre-K contracting agency would hold responsibility for monitoring teacher and site administrator participation in the training in collaboration with the district letters point of contact. So uh, locally, how teachers are supported in community-based uh, settings uh, often varies, especially after the training. And we strongly encourage a collaborative effort between the public schools and the community-based programs. Um, after all, the, the vast majority of the children will be entering public school kindergartens the following year. Um, additionally, uh, DHHS is currently training um, NC pre-K consultants uh, as, as part of this plan. Um, and uh, the OEL is, is, is planning some um, uh, early learning consultants to be uh, facilitators as well uh, for, for future uh, trainings. Um, and then uh, DHHS is also training a group of techno, local technical assistance providers, or they're planning to, excuse me, I don't believe the training started yet. They're planning to train a group of local technical assistance uh, providers, so they're equipped to provide coaching support to community-based programs. Um, I don't have any additional information about that at the moment, um, but, uh, but as more information becomes available, we can certainly provide that. Um, and then uh, DPI is also providing funding for substitutes uh, for teachers to attend training, which includes teachers in community-based settings. Um, for the teachers in, in public schools, uh, these funds are transferred through a PRC code, PRC 085. And then for community-based settings, the funds will flow to DHHS and then from DHHS to local NC pre-K contracting agencies uh, who will then send these funds to each of the uh, community uh, program sites. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for walking us through partnerships. Sure thing. As mentioned several times throughout our time together, the Office of Early Learning has developed several resources aligned to the science of reading for the pre-K classroom. And we would like to share some of those with you now. The first resource is the crosswalk that we've already discussed today, um, a crosswalk with Scarborough's found, um, foundations, teaching strategies, gold, and those kindergarten standards that are supported with early literacy instruction. The next resource is our play to read resources, and these are activities for literacy development in the pre-K classroom. They're intended to support teachers as they support literacy concepts that are aligned to the science of reading, in similar activities, um, teachers are encouraged to create more activities um, that are similar to these in an effort to provide multiple opportunities for children to authentically practice literacy skills. I'll show you real quickly. When you open this, 
Um, again, we reference Scarborough's rope and then there are activities based on centers that you will see in pre-K classrooms. And then you can see this skill, whether it's you know, rhyme and syllables with phonological awareness, uh, letters, uh, print concepts, so you can see the, uh, those skills there. The next resource is an activity, activities for home or outside the classroom with caregivers. And again, these support literacy development while engaging with young children. Um, these highlight activities that are quick and easy to do at, um, outside the classroom with caregivers. The uh, teachers are again invited to create more activities based on the needs and interests of their classroom. If these are printed um, four per slide or smaller or larger, depending on your preference, but they are designed to be able to be printed four per slide for these individual activities in, with the idea that you could hole punch them, put them on a ring or um, pipe cleaner and send them home with parents and caregivers. And then you have the opportunity to highlight certain activities depending on the skills that are focused or that may be a focus throughout the school year um, with, within your classroom. So adding that support with caregivers. We also have read aloud support for pre-K. As mentioned earlier, intentional planning for read alouds is essential and it really helps with building vocabulary and those and language structures. And we have a few, we have a couple examples here. We have the, we have the um, empty templates and then we also have completed examples, including a fiction example, which is Bear Snores On. And we not only include the literacy developmental skills, but we also include uh, additional connections to foundations within the, um, within the structure and the completed example here as well. And lastly, uh, well, two more, but one is our unpacking guides for foundations. If you haven't seen those already, we unpack learning to communicate foundations for reading and foundations for writing. These guides give tips for intentional teachers to use. They also include um, possible what the teacher may observe when you're using the formative assessment process and possible prompts to support children's learning. Again, asking those questions and making comments to support longer and um, more complex answers and sentences as children speak. And a blog post by Lucy Hart Paulson, which who is one of the authors of Letters for Early Childhood Educators, for and that focuses on oral language, optimal learning, and of course learning through play. Our next resource on the slide that we have linked there, and also in your note catcher, is our Literacy at Home, which is North Carolina's digital children's reading initiative. As we scroll down here, you can see that there is a block or a page for each grade level, pre-K through five. And we will click on pre-K here to show you this general structure. Each, a, each age or each grade level has a, the general format, same formatting. Um, the skills are a little different depending on what is appropriate for the age child in that grade. Pre-K pre starts with phonological awareness and then continues with print awareness, vocabulary, fluency, comprehension, and oral language. Each grade level also includes online libraries. For each skill page, there is a definition. What is phonological awareness or, what, or whichever of these skills you may be looking at? And it also includes a video. What does it look like? So we provide an example for parents to see what that may look like or give a very parent-friendly definition um, through video form. Next, you see practice activities. These activities start with um, activities that require um, no printable materials, and then they're followed with activities that do require printables. And for those who have access to a printer or their school can provide the, the printed um, sections for them. Lastly, we have online activities and online activities may be games or other interactive pieces 
that parents and other caregivers can use with children to support those foundational literacy skills. Literacy at home activities are an example of how technology and interactive media can be valuable tools for supporting children's development and learning when used responsibly and intentionally. So we'd like to connect that to, principal, to the DAP Principle 9. Notice that Principle 9 does not specifically mention that the children are using the technology. In some cases, this may be appropriate. However, we focus on how teachers can use technology to support children's development and learning. Digital portfolios can be used to document each child's knowledge, skills, and abilities, and online platforms often include activities for teachers to implement in classrooms to support development within the progression for a specific skill. In addition to the resources developed for pre-K, the Office of Early Learning Literacy page includes um, Read to Achieve memos, which now include pre-K information in an effort to streamline communication. So please be sure to read each of those weekly to stay up to date on all pre-K information as well. FAQs and letters cohort assignments are also housed here. If you are interested in increasing your general knowledge of the science of reading beyond what we our short review earlier today, many resources are also available, including research articles, modules, and webinars. Links to all of these resources are in your note catcher, and we hope that you find these resources helpful as you begin your journey with the science of reading or continue your journey with the science of reading and letters professional development. All right, guys, so as we near the end of our time together, we will review the intended outcomes of today's session. Today, participants received an overview of the science of reading and made connections to preschool guiding works. Participants learned how the science of reading supports and is supported by developmentally appropriate practices for young children. Participants considered necessary partnerships required for effective community-wide launch and implementation of letters for early childhood professional development, and participants were introduced to available resources to support the science of reading. If you haven't already heard, the Office of Early Learning is and the Letters for Little Learners Part 2 is tomorrow, April 8th at 3 o'clock. In response to questions we received from registration, we will explore the content and participant experiences for letters for early childhood educators. We will provide guidance, promising practices, and resources for successful implementation of letters, early childhood educators professional development. Thank if you. I'm going to interrupt you real quick to say I apologize. The slide says April 7th. This was before we had to reschedule, so we apologize for not catching the date change on here. So the it says in our next session, it's tomorrow, April 8th, not April 7th, as it says on the slide. So before completing the evaluation for today's session, in order to receive a certificate of contact hours, please join us in CASEL's third signature practice, an optimistic closure. Within your note catcher, answer the following questions. Who will you talk to next about letters in the science of reading? And what will you discuss with who you speak with? Excellent. Thank you to those that shared in the chat. We appreciate each of you and the support you provide to young learners in the state of North Carolina. Thank you for attending today to increase your knowledge of literacy and language development and letters professional development. 